Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Between Friends, and a very happy holiday to you. Today's class is um, all about big quilts in small steps, because that's how we tackle those big things, right? But before we get started, I want to wish Retha Ranke a happy birthday. She typed in the comments, 69 years. I find that really hard to believe, Retha, because I met you just about a month ago in Houston, and I would never have guessed you're 69, so good for you. Lots of you are telling us you have snow where you are. Up in New York, you have snow. I know in... Uh, in um, Wyoming, they had 12 inches last on Tuesday and a skiff last night. So what's a skiff? I don't live there, so I don't know. Maybe a little bit. I don't know. A dusting. Uh, oh, and uh, Donna Hartwich from Australia. Welcome. Lovely to have you here from down under. Lovely to have you here. You're having your morning coffee, I imagine, right? Uh, let's see. Judith Whitlock said her birthday was on the 13th and she turned 62. Yeah, I like people who... Tell us their age because we really should celebrate these birthdays. Goodness knows we've earned it, right? And, you know, the alternative hmm, is not so good. So celebrate those birthdays. Don't be shy about telling folks how old you are. My mother was 29 all the way till, you know, we said goodbye to her at 80 plus. <laughs> so, I mean, she did eventually uh, tell, but I think things were different then. People are a little bit more transparent. Deborah Little, Little John, you're 72. I love it. Well, I'm 62. I'm the same as the year, you know, so it's always easy for me to remember. Okay. Hi, Marjorie Hirschberger from Lancaster. It's lovely to have you join us. Um, and you just have rain, no snow. Well, I'm in Texas and uh, we don't have any, today we have a beautiful sunny sky, but it's getting cold. And I understand eventually it pretty soon it's going down to the 20s. So, you know, We'll be in a panic here for sure. So our topic today is, you know, um, big, big quilts in small steps. And it's fl my flower box quilt. So it's not very seasonal. You know, here I am dressed up in the holiday gear. But, you know, I know many of us, it's a little late to do a big project like this in time for Christmas, right? So, but this is knowledge that you can apply to any quilt um, or large project that you're working on. But really specifically today, we are going to talk about how to make applique blocks where we press, mark, and place. So we'll do all of that first in those five beautiful floral applique blocks. You know, I cut my uh, block fabric first and do this press, mark, and place. And then the next step is to prepare all of the applique fabrics. And I have three different ways to show you um, how you can tackle uh, applique. And then lastly is quilting. Now this flower box quilt is a 64 page book and it has uh, instructions for doing all over quilting on this beautiful quilt, but also adding some custom dimensions. So that means the quilting is going to go rather quickly because it is all over quilting with just some um, accents in that negative space area and also each block each um, of the five floral applique blocks have custom quilting so those appliques don't have any quilting that stitches over the beautiful floral designs all of the applique is enhanced by quilting that surrounds it so let's go ahead and take a look first over at um, powerpoint and we'll advance over to the press, mark, and place applique block. So mostly for today's class, we're going to concentrate on, uh, this is block number four in the um, flower box quilt. So we're going to talk about each, you know, all the steps on this one. And Donna Harwich, you say, go Packers. Yeah, go Pack, go. Okay, so on the overhead, here we have block four. And this is the layout. It looks a little confusing, right? But really, if you just take a moment to examine it, you'll notice that it's one design repeated four times, mirror imaged again. You can do one of these designs in a six by six hoop or a six by 10, or you can do two in seven by 12, or, or of course, a larger hoop. 
I, you know, I, I don't mind rehooping. So I actually worked in, in um, a smaller hoop. I didn't have a problem with that. And now that the six by six hoop is now available in a monster hoop, I would definitely use that. So you'll see there's a crosshair on each individual floral design. And then there's a big crosshair in on the block. And of course, that also would work for that center embellishment, right? So we got to get all that on our fabric, which, you know, might sound complicated, but you're going to start with an oversized square of fabric. I believe in the, uh, in the, um, instructions in there, we cut a, what do we cut? Um, I think it's 17 inches and then we're going to fold it in half. Well, first I'll do it vertically. We're going to fold it in, in half and then in half again. And then I take this to the iron and give it a really good crease. I don't worry about that because I know I can get it out later on. And then I'm going to use a ruler to um, mark my lines, you know, just a straight ruler. And I use a friction pen. So here I'm gonna switch fabrics because I've already done this one. And so these friction pens, now please test this on your fabric, but I have had great success with these. You can get these in, you know, an office supply store or, or you know, a discount store. And they will remove under uh, an iron, under heat. I understand, I have heard that the lines can reappear when the fabric is uh, below freezing. I live in Texas, it's not gonna be a problem for me. And if that does happen, you can just press them away and, and off they'll go. So, uh, but always test on your fabric and, and then just mark those lines. So you're gonna start with that crease, you're gonna mark right in the crease. And then you can also draw and, you know, the large square, which this is um, 12 inches square. So you'll draw that and then do a diagonal. This, these are going to be the uh, lines that you will actually place your individual templates on. So here I'm using my print and stick target template paper. And because each individual template has a crosshair on it, I can then just match this line with the line that I've marked on my fabric. Now in the book and on the large schematic, it tells you that the center point of this embroidery design, so the point from this crosshair to the center is four and a half inches. So, you know, if I was actually at my machine and stitching this, I would take the time to measure that this is four and a half inches. And um, if you get all the templates down in place, you'll know when one's off because then they're not actually, you know, uh, aligned. And, you know, we'll just take the time to put these four down. Now I have my schematic. I now I know what my plan is and I can start on any corner that I'd like. And that's how easy that is. And you're going to do these four corners first and then you'll place your template for the center right here. Now, what if you had some problems during hooping or so forth? Then you won't, you'll erase these lines with an iron and then you will find the center of these four designs and that's where you will land that final design that's in the center, okay? So don't beat yourself up if it's off, you know, a half inch to the right or to the left or top or bottom. Just erase these lines, start over, by, I mean, not start over, but just place this, the center template in the middle of all your four designs. And then use a ruler to, after all the, all the applique is complete, you will place your quilter's ruler an inch away from the outside of the applique and trim the excess. And that brings the block down to the proper size. So Super easy, right? Super easy. Oh, and Phil Beck, you love the friction pens? Yes, me too. You know, they're, they're really helpful. And here's a tip for those of you who have the top of the line um, brother or baby lock machines where you can scan your fabric. Well, sometimes, you know, we're working on fabric, like if we're quilting white thread on white fabric, and you want to line up your next design, we, you know, no matter how great that scanner is, you're not going to be able to see that line. So just take that friction pen and draw over that stitched line 
and then scan, and then you'll be able to see it. And then you can just erase it with the iron. Okay, so what's next? Now, so that's how I do my press mark and place. And, you know, it's a great way to make um, blocks that are going to have symmetrical tops, bottoms, you know, all corners are symmetrical. And you're starting out with a good square. You're marking your fabric um, accurately. And if your embroidery is a little off, that's okay. You started with a larger piece of fabric. And that's why we do that. It gives yourself a little wiggle room. It also allows you to um, hoop a little more freely so that you can move in the hoop so that you don't have to nail the exact center of that template in the hoop. So. That's uh, important. Okay, so now we can move on to some applique. Let's take a look in PowerPoint. And you know, the traditional approach to applique is to trim in the hoop, and that's to stitch the placement guide on the fabric, on the quilt block fabric, lay the prepared applique. So in this case, um, I use Fuse Me, and that's our fusible web. And I apply that to the wrong side of my applique fabric. And when I do that, I remove that uh, protective paper and then place my applique over that placement guide, stitch the tack down, and then trim right in the hoop without removing the fabric from the hoop, right? And this is the traditional way that we do um, applique that we've been doing it for many years. And, and it works great. But take a look at that design that we're working on right there. That green fabric is um, that swirl design. <laughs> Some tiny little areas in there to uh, trim around. So I have a better product and a better approach to um, cre creating pre-cut fabrics or pre-cut appliques for this design. And that is to use fuse and stick. Now, fuse and stick is tacky. Um, it'll stick, you know, pressure sensitive. It'll stick to the back of the fabric. And then when we remove the protective paper, it's tacky. So it'll stay in place until after um, all the applique is complete. Then we can fuse it permanently. So I thought I would just um, go back to the overhead and show you some of those steps. Now, you can use a, um, a digital cutter to cut out the shapes for, for the applique, or you can use your embroidery machine. So I thought I'd show you how I do this. Literally, I cheat like this. So this is one of the petals that's in that flower design. And so I have one, two, three, four layers of applique because that's going to serve my four different petals that are needed for my four flowers. And I stitch that, um, that design, not the whole, you know, just the petal design. I stitch right on the tearaway stabilizer and this fabric and all of that um, fuse and stick behind it. And then I take it out of the hoop and I cut right on that outline, cut right on it. And then when I go to use this, here you can see it's tacky. It sticks to the surface, so it stays in place. I love that. But here, I actually have that green fabric to show you, that swirl, so you can get a better look at why it was so handy for the green fabric. So here is uh, here I am in my six by six hoop. And I've already done one corner of the design. And here you can see is my fuse and stick prepared applique fabric. I've stitched my tack down, but how I got this piece was by hooping um, a big piece of the green fabric. And first I applied the fuse and stick to the wrong side and then I just kept repeating the design. So you can, you can layer it like I did in this application or you could just repeat um, your hoopings. I decided for all these tiny swirls, it was probably easiest to trim away all this excess fabric if it was a single layer. So I've started to do that here. And you can see you're just gonna cut right on that stitch line. And it's okay if you actually snip those threads, 
It's fine because you're going to have a nice wide satin that's going to cover this raw edge eventually. And you don't want to get too skinny on the inside, but I imagine that that satin stitch will cover it up and you'll have no problem. And, you know, sometimes on squirrels, we, we lose track of what we're cutting away and what we're keeping, right? So if that happens to you, just pause a moment and start working on the other side of the swirl because you know this is gonna have two sides that we're gonna to have to trim away, right? So we'll just take the time to trim in there, remove all that excess. And then it's easier to identify on the swirl um, around that curly Q end exactly where we're trimming and what we're keeping. Now, of course, if you just follow the line, you know, you won't, you won't have any harm. You won't cut the fabric in the wrong place, but it can be a, kind of a, an illusion that is, uh, you know, kind of scares me. <laughs> you know, I don't want to cut the wrong thing, right? So here we go. We're going to trim in here and cut this excess away. There we go. And so now you can see, imagine trying to trim this in the hoop while it was you know attached to the base fabric right that's really challenging so this fusion stick is just perfect for this um, application because here we have our curly cue and it's all ready so i remove that protective paper carefully bit by bit by bit so I can position that uh, skinny piece of fabric, those curly tails right inside that placement guide. And then I'll go to the machine and I'll stitch that the next color, which will be the tack down. And see if you have a little that's misaligned, that's not a problem. You can just lift it and then kind of pull it over into position, right? There we go, there we go. And now when we stitch, we know that our satin is going to cover that up just beautifully. As you can see, it did on this um, example here. So super fun. Notice my alignment marks. All those marks I made are still on the fabric, and I most certainly use them to align the next design. Okay, so the next design for that would be the um, floral outline, those outer petals. And I I did do that in the same manner as that uh, skinny one inside that I showed you and just kept applying them in that fashion and so fast and easy. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, what's next? Let's see. So that's our, um, that's our um, fusion stick, right? And that's to pre-cut the fabric. Now you could pre-cut that with a digital cutter. There are SVG files that are included in the flower box quilt book. So if that's you, the way you like to roll, you most certainly can do that. But um, you could also just use the, your embroidery machine to stitch the outline and, you know, use a contrasting color. You're going to cut right through that thread and, you know, won't be visible. So make it easy on yourself. That white was maybe a little harder to see. I probably should have done black. Okay. So let's go back into PowerPoint and take a look at kind of a new way that I just learned last week with you if you watched Ashley and Stephanie Young on the HTV um, Caesar, right? Oh my gosh. So I had some fun playing with that stuff. Why not, right? Here it is in our sewing room. So um, here is the block that I started using the Caesar. And you can take a look at how pretty that is. Isn't that gorgeous? And so, you know, when it's paired with that King Star, it is just so pretty. So I really, really have fun um, with that Caesar. But so what's so cool about this? Well, you rip it in the hoop. I mean, in the hoop, out of the hoop, it doesn't matter. We are literally just going to rip it away. Oh, my goodness. This is like popping bubble wrap. It's so much fun, right? Or it's like... Um, uh, puffy foam, right? Those of you who use puffy foam, isn't that a fun thing to do is to peel it away? But look how easy that peels just like that. Now, remember, Caesar vinyl, HTV vinyl. Now, I had a piece here that I was going to share with you. 
So just bear with me a minute. Oh, well, I do have the, the beautiful example here. So that's the package. And then let me go get a piece of this Caesar. Oh, here it is. And huh, remember, Stephanie Young said, treat this like fa fabric. Once you remove that plastic carrier, and that's that super shiny thing that you see on this size side, right? Then we just separate that beautiful glitter from that protective carrier plastic shield. And now this is just like fabric, but kind of better than fabric because like you watched me just tear that away, right? I mean, how cool is that? It literally tears that easily. Now, we also learned from Stephanie last week, because it tears so lovely on the outside, it would also do the same on the inside. So once our embroidery is complete, we then take it to the iron and press that so that the glitter is then firmly attached to our base applique fabric. And then I can use this in a pillow, in a quilt, and launder it and just have no uh, problem whatsoever, whatsoever. I know, oh my goodness, I love it. And I love it with the King Star. I mean, it's just so much fun to combine those colors together and just play with them. Because, you know, if I used a regular polyester embroidery thread, it would be so flat on the outside, but it is really nice. Mm -hmm. So let's see some of these folks. We'd love to see it. Uh, what's, yeah, let's do some questions. I haven't uh, paid attention to any questions. Uh, pardon me. So let's see. Does fuse and stick work with the digital cutter? It does work with the digital cutter. I have to think of how you do it. Um, I think how you, how you, you, you apply it to the wrong side of the fabric. And then I believe you place your fabric wrong side down so that the paper is not on the tacky mat. Because if it's on the tacky mat, when you go to separate it, part of the paper will stay on the mat. So you're going to do it fabric side down. That means you'll probably mirror image your design you know, right at your cutter. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Um, yeah, it does really. Oh, and why wouldn't you use your, your digital cutter? Well, Mary, you know, not everybody likes to use their digital cutter and believe it or not, not everybody has a digital cutter. So that's why you can also use your embroidery machine just by stitching that outline, which is going to be the placement guide of your applique design. And, and, and I believe in uh, the Flower Mound, Flower Mound, Flower Box quilt book, you get all the pre-cut files um, it is already prepared for you. So you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, it's just an option for those people who don't use their um, print and their uh, digital cutter. So let's see. Um, um, Okay, so Cheryl Hernandez, you received your HTV collection a couple of days ago and you can't wait to play with it after Christmas. Good idea. So something that I learned when I was playing with it is that I used a 8012 needle, a sharp needle, because I, I was stitching on cotton quilting fabric, but going through that Caesar, which is it's very supple. It, you know, there's no problems with it, but you know, you I initially started with a tiny needle, like a 75, and I found that I had a bit of some thread breakage and I wasn't very happy about that. So when I switched to an 80, I called, first I called Deborah Jones. She filled me in. She said, well, let's try this. And that worked. I'll also tell you, because it is, um, um, it's an interesting product. You may find some residue begins to adhere to your needle. You won't find it in the eye of the needle or in the shaft. You'll find it up higher in uh, on the, the blade itself. And so if that occurs, and, and that didn't occur to me till after like 4,000 stitches, which is actually a lot of stitches in an applique. So don't be afraid of that stitch count. I just took rubbing alcohol and a cotton ball and wiped that blade one time. And then I was good to go for, you know, another three to 5,000 stitches. So don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, let's see, Marianne Dublagla, you want to use your um, your new collection for the HTV and the Caesar and Kingstar with Reen's beautiful hand sketch collection. I think you'll love that. So Reen Wilcoxon of the Embroidery Garden has a collection with dime called um, Hand Sketched Florals, and it's just all raw edge applique. So that would work just lovely with um, this. Yeah. So let's see. And Donna Hartwich says, be careful with the friction pen. If you don't use the lines right away, it can fade in the sunlight or even near a heater. Oh, yeah. I imagine it can, right? It's heat. So yes, be careful of that. I make sure that when I'm marking my fabric and it's something, I make sure it's something that I'm either going to be able to do, uh, stitch and use quickly, like, you know, within a couple of weeks, or um, I make sure that I will be able to mark it again because, you know, if it does fade, no harm, no foul, right? I could just mark it again. But if I'm, you know, sometimes we're marking something that we don't have access to again or something. So just keep that in mind, you know, mark it, stitch it, and then you'll be happy for sure. Okay. So let's see. Wasn't that fun though? Oh my goodness. I love that HTV stuff. So let me clean up some of this so that we can then move on to the quilting because that's another really fun part of um, this quilt. And it's a big part of the quilt. So um, let's uh, go ahead and over a PowerPoint, we'll take a look at the five blocks that come within this book. So we have block one, two, and three. That is um, horizontally across the top of the slide, and then four and five on the bottom. Each of the flowers are unique, right? So all five blocks feature unique flowers and stems. And then each block has some sort of medallion in the center that kind of ties them all together. In block one, we have a big kind of wreath that uh, covers the stems of each floral design and also adds a little berry embellishment in the center. Color number, uh, block number two has a kind of a trapezoid shape that connects each of the four stems of those flowers. And, um, and then we, we've already taken a, well, no, we didn't take a good look at three, but three actually is um, e-stitch applique. So you'll learn how to do that. And then four we've looked at, and then five might be my uh, favorite because I love the way the blooms just, you know, blossom out like that. I feel like there's a lot of movement in that block and so forth. So that's pretty fun. But let's take a closer look at the quilting that's on the flower box quilt. It's amazing what you can do with an embroidery machine by combining custom quilting and all over stipple. Here we have stipple in the negative space, but we have a diamond of kind of a floating diamond. Check out that sashing embellishment, ribbon candy repeated over and over along the horizontal sashing and the outside border of each block. Look at the inside quilting inside the block. Notice the quilting does not run over the actual applique, but instead it surrounds it and just accents that applique. That's kind of a fancy detail. Over here, we just have stipple that has been digitized to fill in the spaces around the applique. And again, that ribbon candy, quilting design repeated all over that, the sashing on the quilt makes a cohesive, beautiful embroidery project. This design is so fun to do, and it's a large quilt, but you don't have to do the whole thing. You can just do a table runner, or you can just do a smaller version. Yeah, so the flower box, when I said a smaller version, how about a fun pillow? I mean, here's a just a fun accent flange 
one block. You know, it's a great way to learn the technique of the press, mark, and place, and how to prepare applique and all of that. And then you have a really, you know, decorative pillow that would look lovely on a on a bed or you know, a, a, in a family room or so or so forth. Of course, you can match the colors to your decor. They don't have to be these bright colors. You know, I tend to like when I make samples to do nice bright colors because I think they're intriguing, right? But the table runner, there's instructions in the um, flower box quilt on to make a table runner. So, and that was actually made by my good friend, Ashley Jones. And that's over on page 60 and 61. So here you would make actually three of the different blocks and learn all of those different techniques. But let's Go ahead over Ed, to PowerPoint and take a look at the individual slide for block four. Now here's the quilting. You can see that um, it surrounds all of the applique. It doesn't actually stitch over the applique. And that's really what we want when we are doing custom quilting on a applique quilt. You don't want to quilt over the applique. Almost all quilts um, you know, when you want to enhance or create a focal point on a quilt, you do that by heavy quilting surrounding it and just allowing that focal point to kind of rise up. That's where the loft is. Everything else that you've stitched will be pressed down. And that's kind of what we want in our applique. So let's go over to the overhead cam and we'll just take a look at um, another, you know, of block four. So these are all individual designs. And, and why did I digitize it like that? Well, let me tell you why. I could have digitized it so that this is one design, right? Or this is one whole design. But I know that it can be very challenging and frustrating to land this area perfectly in your hoop. It's much easier to just go ahead and and land one template in a larger hoop and then move your needle to that design, stitch it, bring up the next design, move it over here and so forth. It's just easier. If you have to rehoop, you do. Um, I think we have a huge Many of us have a huge fear of rehooping, and you know it's really not necessary. It's really not necessary. And then lastly, we would do that uh, center medallion accent, and that again, it's not going to stitch on the applique. It's not going to stitch on any of the applique on the fl flowers or the center medallion. It's just going to accent it. So super fun to do. Really, really beautiful. And you, okay, so Mary Bigo, you say that the background quilting helps keep puckering away. It does, absolutely. You know, often you've heard the term, oh, we can quilt that out when we're talking about puckers and so forth. And, you know, it is true. You, you can do that. But if you use, you know, the steps in the book, you shouldn't have any problems with uh, puckering. I, none of the quilt blocks in the flower box quilt sample do not have any puckering. And so maybe we should talk a little bit about that. Let me see if I can find that fabric. Um, so how did I prepare? Okay, so let's take a look at the overhead cam. So I used our Fuse so soft, which is kind of like a trico knit interfacing, right? And I fuse that to the wrong side of my quilt block, the whole quilt block. Well, this is just a sample I did for today. So it's not all over the entire quilt block, but it should be because if I'm actually going to do four hoopings, I want that behind it. And what that does is that strengthens our cotton quilting fabric. You know, cotton quilting fabric is not really designed, you know, to be an embroiderable, right? I mean, although we do it all the time and so forth, but we have to give it a hand. We have to add a little bit of firmness to that cotton quilting fabric so that we can add all of those satin stitches or, or details, um, you know, that are stitched inside some applique designs. So, um, and then I use our tear away, wash away, uh, fat stabilizer so that after the embroidery, I can just tear that off. I can even pull it out of the center of, um, you know, the appliques if I want to, but I know eventually when I go to launder it, it's just going to be so soft and supple. I won't have to worry about any stiffness. You know, 
because even though it's an embroidered quilt, I want it to be soft. I want it to be like a, a true quilt. I don't want it to be this heavy, dense thing that could stand up on its own, right? Like here's the real quilt. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. So you can see it's soft and supple. Like see how it rolls and folds? I mean, it, it's not going to stand up on its own. It would be lovely to lay under this, you know, and watch a movie. Uh, it, it's soft and, and it's big. It's 80 inches, so 80 by 80. Okay, so let's see. Donna Hartwich wants to know, is this a quilted stitches free motion or digitized? No, they're all digitized. This is a complete project that is done on your embroidery machine. Everything all of the applique, all of the quilting, even the quilting that surrounds the applique has been digitized specifically for each block. So you don't have to guess what design goes with which. And when you um, download the embroidery designs, uh, you will find that they are in folders by block. So you'll have block one, we'll have the applique, um, designs, and then it will also have its quilting designs. Okay, so let's take a little bit more. No video, um, Deborah Morgan says. Well, we're not really experiencing any problem here. So, um, uh, you know, let us know if, if you're maybe refresh your screen. Okay, so I kind of got off my game there. <laughs> I should just, you know, multi, like multitasking is not good for me. Okay, let's go back to PowerPoint and we'll take a look at the ribbon candy sashing. This is a favorite technique of mine for filling in borders and sashing. So we can go ahead over to the overhead cam so you can get a, a, a close up look of that ribbon sashing. So I, I call it ribbon candy. It's that's a a, a term that many uh, traditional quilters use. It's just an embroidery design that travels up and down, up and down like a ribbon, you know, like a taffy ribbon. And so you're going to get a corner design and long pieces to fill in the borders and then also for the sashing because, you know, the sashing is quite long and that's what makes up the, um, you know, the bulk of the design. So let's go back to PowerPoint and you can see this is what a ribbon candy design looks like. So that's what I mean. It just goes up and down and up and down. It's my term or, you know, it's a common term, but you can call it whatever you'd like. So you get really good at continuous quilting. And it's super easy because, you know, there, you'll print templates of each of the ribbon candy designs. And then you'll center your, your needle over the center of the template, but then you can also go to the outside edge of the design and it should connect with the previously stitched design. Uh, let's see, Elizabeth Dickerson, did I stitch it in variegated thread? I did not stitch it in variegated thread. I matched my thread to the fabric that it was stitching on. So the pink sashing has pink thread, the yellow sashing has yellow thread, but that's a great idea. It would you know, cut down on thread changes if I had found one uh, variegated thread that would have worked for everything, right? Okay, so let's see. So here is a close up of doing a corner. And, you know, it's easiest to just work on the corner, right? Instead of trying to have like the letter L, like a really long leg on one corner, just get that corner down and then bring up the next design, which will fill in the space to the next corner. Very easy to do. And all of this is outlined in the book, step by step, we hold your hand. So now let's talk about quilting the negative space. And the negative space is, you know, there's a lot of it, right? Because the sashing is just those narrow strips that go across the quilt, uh, connecting each large block, right? And the negative space is all this area that's in between. But I wanted it to have, you know, a straight edge at the top of um, the sashing or the bottom of the sashing so that that stipple wouldn't stitch across my sashing. So that's why, as we go over to PowerPoint, you can see, now look at the bottom, right? It says puzzle bottom. And that design, you can repeat that 30 times to get the width that you need. And it will connect with a um, like a female partner, you know, or opposite partner on the top that would have a, a concave 
end and a straight end. And that's what fills in those, you know, that negative space. So it works out really well. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. And then, you know, just to make it challenging, I added some like diamond elements. So here, let me move my quilt so you can kind of see that under the uh, camera. There we go. So here you can see we have one big diamond and this stitch is like in a you know heartbeat. Um, goodness, it's stitched so fast, maybe three minutes. And, but it fills a big space on the quilt. So also in the collection, you're going to get a kind of a triangular stipple design that you will use to fill in this corner and then you'll mirror it here and on each corner and then that fills in that big area and then you'll carry on and fill in these open you know these other open spaces so it's kind of like a puzzle but it comes together very well can this can this be made into a queen size king size quilt sure kathleen you could make it into a king size quilt you would just start with wider blue strips. Let's call them the blue strips, right? That's like the negative space. I would keep my blocks the same. I would just make those blue strips wider and how you place your blocks, would you would just um, position them so that they would be further apart. And, you know, I just kind of did a random um, placement, as you can see, right? They're not really in uh, a symmetrical order. They're just randomly placed. So you would just maybe have a little bit more space, but it's a big quilt. It is. And, you know, you wouldn't have to do much more to turn it into a, um, a king size quilt. And so let's see, Candy Bray is the, is the quilt three layers. Oh yeah. Top backing and batting. Absolutely. And I use wool batting because wool batting uh, it, it's just a favorite of mine. It, it gives you the loft that you're often seeking. You know, cotton batting, as warm and snuggly as it is, is already needle punched, right? So if you feel the difference between cotton batting and wool batting, wool batting is really uh, light and airy, and you can compress it with your fingers and, you know, feel it compress quite a bit. Cotton batting, not so much. It's already compressed. So when you add your quilting to it, you're not, you're, it'll be beautiful, but you won't have a loft area. And that's the beauty of wool batting because it leaves the loft in there that we're often, um, achieve, you know, trying to go for. Okay, so what's the last thing we have to do when we are making a uh, quilt? <laughs> right? I think we all know this, binding. So I used my weightless quilter to both quilt it and also to bind it. And it really came in handy for the binding. I can tell you that. It's a big quilt, right? So it's a lot of bulk. And when you are adding the binding, you're going to do all four sides, obviously. And it's quite a long length of stitching. So to have you know, half of it, held in place by the weightless quilter was just delightful. So I would start at one corner about mm, eight inches away from a corner and then stitch that binding all the way down to the next corner, rot and then turn the corner. And then I would get up and rotate the quilt, clamping two new blocks, two new corners in the weightless quilter and continue on the next, yep. Okay, so let's see. Uh, Sheila Vetter wants to know, does wool batting reduce the washability of the quilt? Absolutely not. It's already been pre-shrunk, I believe. I've never had any problem with it. And it just launders beautifully. It's also in natural fiber. So it's lovely to sleep under. It's very lightweight because of just the way that it's sold and made. Um, you know, some wool is quite heavy, right? But wool batting is not heavy. It's very lightweight and it allows your body to breathe, which is, you know, comfortable, right? Isn't that what we want? So it, yeah, I love it. Another combination that you can do if you're really going for, um, you know, the big time, you can combine two batting. So that would be cotton on the bottom and then a layer of wool on top. And that is often how show quilts are created so that you get that weight, but you also get that loft. And of course you would want that wool on top underneath the quilt top. So, but that's, you know, it, it's, that's an endeavor. Just try to uh, 
experiment with that on small pieces first, maybe. Okay, so I want to show you the beautiful, um, uh, let's see, the, uh, Ashley Jones is a table runner that she did. So let's go ahead and take a look at that in PowerPoint. There you go. Isn't that lovely? What a great way to do that. It's just wonderful. Um, it, she did a really tropical colors on a white background that just scream, you know, summertime to me, that just looks lovely. And you'll get, in, you know, of course that is in the book and it's really handy to have. So let's see, Donna Hartwich wants to know, is the pattern only physical? No, the pattern, the book is, um, printed, but you will be um, referred to a link in the book to download the embroidery designs. There's no CD in it. So, you know, hard hardcover book, well, not hardcover, but printed book, and then um, you'll download the designs once you receive that for sure. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, of course, today's Between Friends episode is brought to you, brought to you by the Flower Box Quilt, and we have a special on that. It is only $29.99 and you get um, all of the instructions. You'll learn how to um, do the mark, press and place method. You will uh, get all of those embroidery designs. You'll even see my uh, tip for basting a quilt with pool noodles. I love to do that and makes it super fast and easy. I suggest you take time to read through the, the, you know, the book before you tackle any of the blocks and especially the quilting, kind of, you know, absorb the process and, and then you'll learn the steps and then you'll have great success. So I most certainly appreciate all of you um, joining me today. And I do, I have another slide that I want to share with you because next week we are going to take, um, off for the holiday. So no between friends on 1222. So next week, no between friends, but the following week I'll be back and Deborah Jones is going to join me. We're going to talk all about stabilizer. So uh, we'll probably have like a little new year's celebration. So maybe you'll join us at that time. But in case you have trouble remembering here, let's take a look at how you can be notified to know when we're going live. We want to make sure you are being notified every time we go live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. And here's a quick tutorial on how you can set up your live notifications. First, on your home page, click on the search button. Look for us. Click on the three little dots on our page. A pop-up will appear. Select on manage follow settings. Click on live videos and enable notifications. Make sure they're all set to all. Now you're all set. We, we want to make sure you are being notified every time we go live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. And here's a quick tutorial on how you can set up your live notifications. First, on your home page, click on the search button. Look for us. Click on the three little dots on our page. A pop-up will appear. Select on Manage Follow Settings. Click on Live Videos and Enable Notifications. Make sure they're all set to all. Now you're all set. Okay. So I, now it's time to uh, reveal the on the house design. We have one this week and there will be one next week for you. So if you remember on the 22nd, on the 22nd to go and retrieve it, Please do that. And then, of course, we'll have our project on the 29th. So let's take a look.
this week's design is that beautiful cardinal. And I'll tell you, he's been digitized beautifully. The color blending is outstanding. So our big thank you to Deborah Jones. You know, she's the one who selects the artwork, oversees the digitizing of this on the house program. And we couldn't be more grateful and proud of all of her work that she's put into on the house. So here at Dime, we wish all of you a very Merry Christmas and a happy holiday and whatever holiday you celebrate. We hope that it's filled with joy and family and friends. And we'll see you on the 29th.